Thank you for joining us today, everyone. Zeiss is going to be talking about adapting to today's workplace. We have an agenda for you. My name is Brian Rogoff. You might have known me from being in the industry for about 20 years. I had the privilege of coming on board with Zeiss not too long ago as senior product manager of disease management. We have an agenda today. As you can see, we're going to be doing an introduction with my esteemed colleagues. We're going to go over Zeiss's COVID-19 task force existing Zeiss solutions to help you support your patients during the COVID-19, some clinical feedback from our customers, as well as Zeiss solutions for adapting to the new workflow. So let me start it off with introductions and, and have uh, John Menard introduce himself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Menard. I'm an associate product manager here at Zeiss, uh, focusing on fundus imaging products. Hi, my name is Hanayo Spitz. I'm Head of Professional Education for our diagnostic side of the business covering optometry. Hi, I'm Eric Larson. I'm the HFA Product Manager at Zeiss. Excellent. So welcome everyone. So we're going to go straight into basically what we've heard from our customers during this pandemic and how Zeiss can really support our customers. And that required doing a lot of listening. I had the privilege of actually being uh, the product manager for the COVID-19 response team here at Zeiss, where through the executive leadership, we basically took all sorts of sources from R&D, from product management, from all the different business leaders of Zeiss to be able to help the customers with the management of the chronic eye disease from the impact of COVID-19. And as you can see, the mission was how Zeiss can help the customers during this time. And Basically, since from March to about June of 2020 this year, we met about three times a week. And the framework that we really wanted to focus on is helping our customers with their immediate challenges, but also help customers regain productivity during the ramp up and also prepare and support customers in the new normal as they're experiencing right now. It was critical that we basically got the voice of all the customers out there to really understand where the pain points are. And we reached out to not only the customers, but some key opinion leaders. And we received over 75 ideas. And each idea was actually evaluated and investigated and was funneled along on how quickly it can be implemented. Some of these ideas that had come through were some home kits for providers, visual acuity applications for mobile devices, uh, some mobile solutions for wet AMD monitoring, telemedicine and consultation, remote diagnostic centers, and we even got them to building ventilators. But some of the things that we really implemented and was able to come to the immediate attention for our customers was that we were expeditiously uh, wanted to make sure that we had cleaning instructions for all our ODX devices. We wanted to make sure that we were protecting not only our staff and the patients, but also the doctors with slit lamp breath shields, disposable protective gear, operational guides for our different instrumentations, such as a Cirrus, to be able to operate at a safe distance, uh, HFA bowl cleaning, and also the support for Claris Connect. So first, the other things we heard from our customers that we want to understand, how many of these existing features and benefits of the Zeiss solutions could be leveraged in this new environment. With that said, I'd like to start our discussion with the HFA3. To get a little bit more in depth, we have Eric Larson, Senior Product Manager, to help us walk through some of the important elements of the HFA3 and how they can help support your daily practice during the COVID-19 landscape. We have been working on HFA innovation for over 30 years. And so we, we really never stop on that. Um, I, I go out to a lot of customer sites over the years. And if you walk into any clinic in the world, pretty much, you ask them what they would like for uh, some new innovation on the HFA. And it's generally a faster test. Um, patients and technicians would like, would prefer a faster test. They want to get through that test as, as quickly as possible. So about two years ago, we in, innovated with CETA, the, the way that we run the test, and we created CETA faster. And so this was applied to the 24-2 pattern. And if you know the history of uh, HFA, we had CETA standard, which was, is, and still is really the gold standard in, in threshold perimetry. And then we innovated to CETA fast, which shaved some time off that. And so now we have CETA faster. So like I said, that was a, about two years ago, we introduced that. 
it's 50% uh, faster than CETA standard and 30% faster than fast. Of course, people always want to know when you get a faster test, are you giving up anything? And there was actually a, um, a multi-site study done to compare CETA fast, faster, and standard, and to look at that very question. And I've got the reference on the slide here of the, the paper that was published. Anders Hale was the, the lead investigator. And the results were basically that all three algorithms gave very similar results um, in, in the confidence limits over the whole range of threshold values especially from normal to sort of moderate um, defect range, which is really the important part for early assessment of glaucoma. Once you're into the deeper defects, you're really into the monitoring and faster is still a good test to run, but um, it, it has more variability in that range. But um, in, the, you know, in the early to moderate range, it really is very comparable to fast and standard. So what this did was allow people to speed up their test. And I've talked to practices that have um, adopted CETA faster, and they've actually been able to add um, additional visual field testing slots to their day. In some places, two or three slots per day, meaning that they can get more patients through. And then as COVID really flared up, people turned to how can I safely get patients through the office as quickly as possible without sacrificing the quality of the information that I'm getting. And again, CETA Faster was a really good alternative for them. And a lot of people have looked at CETA Faster more closely since the COVID thing. And being able to test quickly and move patients through without sacrificing the information that the doctor's getting, it was really important to them. One of the ways that that really helps is we're able to mix um, the CETA Faster tests into GPA. So you can keep your, your threshold uh, information from standard and fast, add CETA faster and still combine with your GPA analysis. So you're not losing that progression history. So that was a really a nice innovation, both before the, the, the COVID time and during and getting people back to work as, as safely and quickly as possible. Another uh, test that we added was the 24-2C. And this is a new test pattern that was developed with clinical experts in the field where we added 10 additional test points to the 24-2 pattern. And these points were not just randomly picked, they were the most prevalent in glaucoma diagnosis. And so we took them from the 10-2 pattern and added to the 24-2. And so you get more information in the central 10 degrees. And what this allows a lot of people to do is either gain more confidence in the way that they are testing and the information they're getting, and it allows a lot of people to stop running the 10-2 because the 10-2 is a very specific test that takes up a, a lot more time and it takes the, the, the place of where you could get the, the general 24-2 test. So the 24-2C was released about a year ago and it's on the CETA faster as well. So it runs about the same amount of time as the 24-2 CETA fast. So combined with all, all of these new innovations in the HFA3, people are able to run faster, get patients through more quickly without sacrificing the information that they get. And that has resulted in a lot of um, benefit to customers both before and during the COVID time. Thanks for that, Eric. I know you had reached out to quite a few customers during, during this time. Uh, the ones you had reached out to, were they currently using the CETA faster prior to COVID and are they gonna be changing? Or if you heard if they're gonna be changing back to their, their previous workflow? Right, like, like any new strategy or innovation in ophthalmology or pretty much any, uh, any field, there's people that adapt very quickly and others that want to kind of wait and see how things go. So we had quite a few customers take it on right when we first released it. They got the idea of it very quickly. They wanted to add more testing slots. They wanted to get the patients through more quickly, more efficiently. And so a lot of people had adopted before COVID. But um, as I said, with the COVID um, and everybody kind of scrambling to figure out how to adapt to that. And uh, CETA Faster really became something that was looked at again. And so I've gotten a lot of questions during the last, during the summer about CETA Faster. And we've sent all, that paper out a lot to people to reinforce how the accuracy and the reproducibility are very similar to the other tests. So a lot of people are looking at it now. We've got a couple of um, people that have experience with it. So if you can advance the slide just one more. Richard Madonna was one of the early adopters of it and really got the idea of being able to test more quickly 
with the CETA faster, but then also having the 24-2C to, uh, to use with, with those patients that you either suspect there's some central damage. For example, if you have an OCT scan that shows some, some early uh, signs of structural damage, but you're not seeing anything in the, in the perimetry yet, you can run the 24-2C just to kind of give yourself a little bit more confidence that you're covering that central portion more, more thoroughly and either rule in or rule out a scotoma that's developing. Dr. Murray Fingeret is a great friend of ours and has given us a lot of feedback on it. You know, he was looking at it from the standpoint of not having to run the 10-2 quite as often. Um, he really likes to be very thorough at the VA. So not having to run the 10-2 the, uh, the as frequently was really a big benefit to him because a lot of um, you know, elderly patients that really can't hold up to that test and the 24-2C gives you that coverage of the 24-2 plus the, the central 10 degrees. And uh, Danica Morelli uh, really got the, the workflow efficiency part of it. Uh, she really expressed it well with the, you know, anything we can do to make it faster for the patient, easier for the patient. Uh, we're gonna get better information, not only from the fatigue factor, but from just being able to give patients the test more frequently, maybe. You know, maybe it's easier to bring them back in for a second test during the year. Um, so CETA faster has really impacted people a lot of, a lot of different ways. Oh, that's fantastic. That's, it's really good to hear the voice of the customer, how some of these features that were already there could really help out practitioners manage these chronic diseases during the COVID-19. So thank you so much, Eric. Sure. We'll be back with you in just a little bit. We're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about the Claris 500, which is ICE's ultra wide field fundus camera. And we're going to now turn to John Menard, the Associate Product Manager, to help us understand how the Claris can provide us in today's workplace. Hi, John. Hi, thanks, Brian. So if, as you see on screen, um, the, the central image of the Claris is 133 degree wide field. And when you take a second shot, um, you can combine those two for up to 200 degree ultra wide field. So a single Claris image covers the standard ETDRS seven field grid. And one of the things I want to point out about that is that with traditional fundus photography, you, to get uh, additional images uh, that are either superior or inferior, right, you have to take additional shots. But with Claris, the entire grid fits in one image. And with that, uh, the Claris images do have resolution down to seven microns, giving you some incredible detail on these. And a lot of that image quality is in thanks is thanks in part to the confocal lens that is used on that. And as you can see from the from that central image, that really there's no litter lash uh, seen in it. And additionally, the use of broadline fundus imaging is what gives the Claris imaging uh, its incredible true color. So, can you explain a little bit more about the the broadline fundus imaging and how it provides a, a better picture quality? Yeah. So when we designed Claris, um, we used broadline fundus imaging uh, to get the true to really get true color in that. And what broadline imaging does is use three color channel LEDs, and is captured and the image is captured by a monochromatic camera. And so the Claris software takes those three images and then combines it so that you can see really on screen uh, some inc the, the true color of the uh, uh, of what the Claris provides. So obviously with the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, and you have to be very conscientious about social distancing and pr protecting not only the patient, but also our staff and, and trying to keep as much space between them. Can you explain how the, the Claris and that workflow helps promote this distancing? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So w when you couple together some of the pieces I talked about earlier about the single shot, being able to cover the ETDRS 7 field grid and the true color imaging. Um, and you start talking about workflow. So there are efficiencies that Claris can really bring you, um, but like taking it, just use it, utilizing a single shot. Um, we have software options are built in that do auto bright. So you don't have to manually adjust any of your images. Um, our next release will incorporate optic nerve head detection so that it, when you're aligning a patient that may, might be a little less compliant, right, that optic nerve head detection will help you position much better. And one of the things to point out about that is that Claris can be utilized in a uh, no-touch workflow compared to some of the other cameras that are on the market where manual aid might be required. 
um, the picture on screen shows the technician utilizing a joystick and positioning so that you can keep that, uh, that distance between you and the patient so that they feel safe and your technicians feel safe also. Now, additionally, we are going to, we, we have uh, released a, an additional breath shield attachment that fits over the clarus. And again, that's to provide, uh, you know, help provide peace of mind and safety at the same time. That's great. And you know, let's now turn towards the Cirrus OCT. One of the key things that we've discussed is, is so far as speed and, and reducing chair time. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on how the Cirrus helps practices in this aspect of their business? Yeah, I, absolutely. So one of the main questions that we've received from our customers um, about Cirrus is um, how do we improve efficiency? Or um, an additional question was, how do I reduce my exposure to the patient and to me while uh, they're in the practice as well? And um, OCT is the fastest uh, detailed diagnostic test that we can perform in the office, but how do we make it faster? So Cirrus 6000 captures OCT scans 270% faster than previous Cirrus devices. Additionally, OCTAs are captured 43% faster than, than, our, than the uh, prior family model. To give you a good point of reference, MAC cube scans take half a second. It really is that fast. And I know sometimes with speed, you can compromise uh, quality. And uh, as far as, you know, with Zeiss customers, they're used to quality with Zeiss products. Can you talk about the level of quality and detail that Sears can get when, they, uh, when it comes to the speed? Yeah, and we really worked on improving speed without compromising image quality. And on screen is a excellent example of the detail that can be seen in the HD one line raster with the improved speed and quality both of the uh, of the Cirrus 6000. So let's go through a, a quick summary here of I guess the Cirrus overall when it comes to uh, the, the workflow as well as the, the image quality. Essentially, the Cirrus 6000's ability to take 100,000 scans per second has allowed us to provide higher efficiencies um, through rapid speed of acquisition, uh, a, a higher image quality, and wider field of view. And you, if you combine those two, um, it results in greater uh, patient throughput. So the evolution of the Cirrus platform will continue with software developments that we have coming uh, that will further enhance these image efficiencies. Thanks, John. That, that's fantastic. And before we transition over, talking through some of the clinical feedback we received from some of our great customers, there has been a lot of work that's been done by our clinical education team. I uh, want to mention Forum and the Retina Glaucoma Workplaces. This is like the best kept secret at Zeiss, uh, if you don't have this already. Having this quality of data from each of these instruments as we discussed so far is absolutely essential to provide the best possible care with the most efficiencies while you have the patients there. But having a solution like Forum in conjunction with these workplaces really allows a clinician to bring all these pieces of the puzzle of chronic disease into one location. Having the ability to compare data side by side for all different modalities and to compare previous visits without flipping back and forth between charts and any type of missing data. This allows you to be able to look at your patients more holistically and provide them with as much information as possible, making you more confident in your clinical decision making and in the most efficient manner. So with that said, I want to trans over uh, in the discussion with Hanayo Spitz, who's head of our optometric diagnostic professional education and have her discuss some of the insights we were able to gain from our customer conversations as well as some of the exciting educational events that Zeiss has hosted and uh, where you can find some of these clinical resources. So Hanayo, um, Zeiss has had a long history of doing these events and over the last few years starting getting even into the digital event space. Can you share about what Zeiss has been doing and has done thus far from these clinical, from a clinical education standpoint. Absolutely, thank you, Brian. So in the past, a majority of the programs that we've done were truly live, whether that's symposiums, user group meetings, hands-on workshops, or meet the experts in the booth. 
surrounding regional, national, and global trade shows. But we demonstrated our agility by converting to an all digital platform in the last couple months with multiple webinars a week, specific topics and subjects based on target groups, um, collaboration with optometric students and generating um, educational content as well as aiding in their further development with relationships with manufacturers such as ICE. So since mid-March, we've completed around 20 webinars, um, clinical reach with technicians, photographers, optometry, ophthalmology, as well as optometric students, um, completed seven virtual trade shows and events in partnership with internal ZEISS groups, as well as external third parties, such as Covalent Careers and CE Wire. Um, completed also six optometric institution programs with peer-to-peer -peer education, first student grand rounds, as well as resident grand rounds. And in the midst, we're actually completing also our first ever ophthalmology and optometry collaborative program covering retina, glaucoma, and surgical Zeiss solutions. So regardless of our platform, our core competency is to continue generating valuable educational content for our clinicians. How many uh, attendees did we wind up having uh, from some of these events? Gosh, anywhere from the optometric um, student population we had around 800 in the last um, couple webinars that we've done anywhere from 7,000 to 8,000 total participants so it's been really amazing. Now I know uh, beyond just these events that Zeiss has hosted uh, or even talks given on behalf of Zeiss the professional education team does a lot of roundtable discussions with our key opinion leaders. Can you provide some of these perspectives on how those conversations have shifted and what they've meant to Zeiss during COVID. Absolutely, you know, parallel to what you've mentioned, Brian, earlier with the Zeiss COVID task force, receiving input from our fellow clinicians, as well as, you know, John and Eric have mentioned, our optometric clinical team within Zeiss also work on our diagnostic devices. We at Zeiss understand the value of optometric partners. And within professional education, we're continually seeking new and unique forms of education that are applicable to our fellow clinicians. So therefore, we rely heavily on the input of our optometric partners. So since mid-March, we've had virtual ad boards with 14 hours of collaboration with private group and academic clinicians. And through these discussions, we've focused our efforts in educating on the clinical utility of Zeiss solutions for those that are current users as well as those that are interested in new technology. We've also pivoted topics on relevant content now, such as COVID impact on optometry, cleaning and sanitization of equipment, um, telemedicine and hybrid telehealth, as well as psychological impacts of COVID. So through such discussions with our optometric partners, we've generated unique educational programs, such as the ones I've previously mentioned, collaborative ophthalmology and optometry programs, university and resident programs, and ophthalmic photographers and technician-focused education. Additionally, we really heard the need for on-demand, short consumable content, and we've created the Zeiss Professional Education Portal, which is a repository of on-demand content with articles and videos in partnership with Covalent Careers, and also generated a Med Support Now page, which I know Brian will go into a little shortly. But Brian, you know, I've shared a lot here, but what I really want to emphasize is Zeiss is here to stay and Zeiss is here to be a partner to optometry. That's fantastic. And as many people may not know out there, you know, we're constantly always listening to the customer and, and it's great to get that feedback, not only from the customer, but from our key opinion leaders. And some people may not know out there, but Zeiss also, we have a lot of optometrists on board that help out with our, our clinical development when it comes to our instrumentation. And so it's not only that we're receiving the feedback from the customer, but we're also understanding the workflow and the efficiencies of our current optometrists that help us work, make sure that these instruments get better and they're serving your needs. So that was fantastic, thank you so much. And, and some of these key suggestions that, you know, they keep on coming on in. And we've actually, as you mentioned, launched a support website that has all kinds of these resources for you and your practice out there. Uh, I wanna focus a little bit more on some topics in greater detail. So I'm gonna go, come back to Eric and John and talk a little bit more about, let's, the HFA bulk cleaning. I know this has been a hot topic out there, especially on social media. 
So I'm going to ask Eric, you know, now that we've gotten some feedback from our customers and, and about cleaning the bowl between the patient uses, can you explain how the process was, how our teams had to evaluate the cleaning procedure and share a little bit about the new prescribed way of how to clean the HFA bowl? Yeah, sure. That's, uh, it was exciting times back in March and April when the, the COVID virus really hit the U.S. And, um, you know, we'd been getting some questions from, from Europe and, and Asia to some extent, but when it hit the U.S., my phone was ringing off the hook about how do we clean the HFA? Because, you know, we standard procedure is to wipe without call the chin, chin rest and forehead rest, but we actually in the user manual make a point of saying don't you know, wipe the, the surface of the bowl itself because it's a reflective surface and that's where the stimulus light is shown. So you don't want to change the reflective surface. And, and that was fine for, you know, the decades that it's been out there. But all of a sudden, there was this big concern about the, the bowl being this repository of virus and, you know, the fear of, uh, you know, what was happening there. Is it safe for patients to use it or not? So we very quickly gathered with our engineers to figure out how we could create a cleaning procedure for the bowl and, and what the effects would be of, of regular cleaning on the bowl, because basically you need to be cleaning between each patient. And so we, within a few days, came up with a uh, alternative method where we um, have a spray mister of 70% isopropyl alcohol, which is, you know, the CDC says that that's effective for killing virus on the surfaces. And so you spray the mist in the bowl and let it settle on the surface and air dry. You know, from beginning to end, I've had customers tell me that, that it takes about two to five minutes between, you know, the spraying and then letting it dry. And so it's really uh, effective, you know, as far as being efficient for between patient uh, cleaning. Um, of course, there's no way to know how well it's affecting the virus, but it's a, a cleaning procedure that you know should be effective and, and can be effective. And a lot of customers have taken this up. And so when, when we put this out on our uh, med support website, my phone went to ringing like constantly to almost nothing at all. It was like, oh, okay, thanks. You know, you gave us a procedure, you gave us something that's workable and we can, we can work with this. And I followed up with a lot of customers and, and they say, yeah, it's just part of our routine now. They just, you know, everything else, there's a lot of personal protection equipment that they have to go through now. Procedures, you know, with the patients and with the staff. And, and this is just one more thing that they, they have to accommodate, but it's a very easily accommodatable in, in the process. And so I've talked to customers where they went from zero visual field testing back in March and April to, you know, people have been opening up back up in, in various stages. But I've talked to a lot of people who are back to, you know, 75 to 100 percent of their visual field testing again and feeling very confident about it. And I was on a webinar the other night where Shalini Sood from Cleveland Clinic was, um, was talking about this topic as well. Another thing we put out was that the air circulation with the fans in the in the HFA actually circulate the air about three times of the bowl volume per minute. And with that information, she was looking at that and, and saying, you know, that means that the air in the bowl is basically the same as the air in the office. She said, you know, that give between the cleaning and the air circulation gave them the comfort that, yeah, this is a device that they can use and uh, they're confident in just, you know, taking the patients through and, and testing like normal. So. It was a really nice uh, response from the engineering team and our communication team to be able to get this information out really quickly. The med support website has been fantastic for, for customers to be able to self-access the information. We've been updating it very frequently, coming out with written procedures and then videos to help people out with, with how to do this um, in a very, very short period of time. So I'm really proud of the response that Zeiss made on this and especially keeping visual field testing alive because it's such a critical part of the glaucoma management process. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, I, I, I know all the work and all the updates that you and the team have been doing to make sure that we got that out to our customers. Speaks to also about not only uh, the cleaning procedure and disinfectant procedures that Zeiss wanted to make sure that we were helping our customers as we heard that that was a major thing to help their patients. Let's turn it back over with John. And, and John, you spoke a little bit about the social distancing with the Claris, but can you uh, give a little bit more about the solution that Zeiss introduced with social distancing in the office for the practitioners using the Sears and HFA? Yeah, thanks, Brian. So uh, when the COVID task force was formed, the, um, I, I was fortunate enough to be, uh, be one of the members of uh, the Sears team 
to help work on some of those solutions. And the image on screen um, shows two different ones. The one on the left is actually quite simple in its, uh, in its implementation. Think of it like this. When you operate a Cirrus, you, really, you have to be basically in front of the instrument to control it and be very close to the patient as well. With the Cirrus instruments, uh, they utilize Bluetooth keyboards and mice. And so with Bluetooth, uh, you can take your keyboard and mouse a, you know, a distance away and control the instrument. Well, by simply adding an additional monitor cable, and monitor cables really you can get off the shelf really at any office supply store um, in distances of uh, six feet or more, you can take that monitor cable and plug in an additional monitor. And as you can see in the picture, um, create that six foot social distance. Um, and while still controlling it uh, and talking to the patient at the same time. Now, one of the other ones that we came up with is a little more advanced. And for anyone that might be a little bit familiar with uh, IT terminology, you've probably heard the term um, remote, connect uh, remote desktop connection or remote connection. We used a off the shelf um, application to, to provide that called TeamViewer. Now, what TeamViewer does is with, when an instrument is, net, is connected to your network, you can really operate a Cirrus in the same fashion um, by remotely connecting to it from anywhere in your office. That could be from a, you know, if you happen to have a computer in the uh, testing room also, or one that might be just outside the testing room, you can remotely connect to the Cirrus as though you were standing in front of it and control it in the same fashion. Now that that's fantastic. Thanks so much, John. I mean, it's good to know that we're able to use our devices in a safe distance. We've had the cleaning procedure. So this all definitely will help out our folks here. Can you go a little bit more with the HFA and how what we have done there for social distancing? Yeah, so with HFA3, um, what, I allude, what I talked about earlier for Cirrus, um, you can effectively utilize the same uh, technique um, with an additional monitor cable. Um, and again, Bluetooth keyboard and mouse, you can plug in, plug those in, creating that uh, six foot distance. That's, that's great to see that we're able to use that also with the HFA3, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Well, that concludes our discussion for today. And I wanna thank my esteemed Zeiss teammates here for their support and their help. Also, thank you so much for joining with us today. It's, we hope it's been informative and helpful you to see some of the things that we've been doing since the start of the COVID-19 outbreak and how we're continuing to adapt and how we're able to get these solutions quickly to you. At Zeiss, we want to support you however way we can and also help your practice adapt to this new normal. If there's anything we can do to support you, please reach out to your local representative and we'd be happy to help you however we can. Thank you again. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of the program.